Good morning, church. Love you guys. Good to see you. Thanks, Chad. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> hey, go ahead and open up your Bibles to Isaiah. We're jumping back into Isaiah. So I am really excited about this. Keenan and I actually went through a preaching workshop this last week. Keenan kind of joked about it. We're going to learn how to preach. I actually felt like that happened for me. Like it, it was revolutionary kind of for me. It was just, I learned so much. Um, felt like I... Um, it, it was really good. We, we prepared these uh, messages, basically, an outline, and like Keenan said, and then we would share them with this group. And so I prepared my outline, and I spent a lot of time on it. I was really excited, and I presented it, and then I just got torn to pieces, and it was beautiful. Like, we share it with all these pastors, and they're like, well, you're not right here, and you're not right, and that's kind of wrong, and it was just, it was so good. I'm not, I'm not, it was really, really good for me. I learned so much, and um, it was, it was really helpful. So I'm hoping to bring some of these things into Isaiah that we've learned, and um, I'm really excited for what the Lord might do here. And so I'm going to pray and ask for help. We'll give you kind of a review, overview of where we've been in Isaiah, the structure of Isaiah, some things to look for, okay? And then we'll um, jump into Isaiah 36. Okay, so Father, we um, just know that this is your word to us, God. Um, we, we, you, you speak to us, you've spoken to us in many ways and many times, and now in these last days, God, you've spoken to us through your prophets and through your, your apostles and through your Son, and it's been recorded for us here in the Bible, Jesus. And so we listen intently and eagerly to Isaiah the prophet this morning, and I just pray that your word would speak this morning. God, we don't want to hear me speak, we don't want to hear Kenan speak, we don't want to hear any, we want to hear you, the God of the universe, speak. And so it's amazing that you see a small church like us, and you care about a small church like us, and you still want to speak to a small church like us. And so we just want to hear from you. Would you uh, open your word for us this morning? I pray we would understand Isaiah 36 better when we leave today than when when we, when we came, I pray we love you more when we leave today than when we came. We pray for your help. Amen. Amen. So a little bit of background in Isaiah 36 uh, before we jump into reading the whole chapter here. Um, uh, I, I don't know if you guys remember, but um, Isaiah is kind of structured where we've got Isaiah 1 through 6, which is a summary of Isaiah's ministry and his calling. Right? So we've got Isaiah 6, where he's standing before the Lord, he's on his face, this magnificent scene, and, and, and he goes to be God's servant. Right? And he's going to preach to a people that will never listen, going to preach to a people that are not going to hear him. Uh, and this is his life. This is his lot in life. This is his ministry. And so after this summary and this commissioning of Isaiah, we get Isaiah 7 through 35. Okay, and, and, and seven, we get um, uh, this interaction with Isaiah speaking to the king Ahaz. And there's some people, there's some kings that are coming, Assyria and Israel are coming in to take over uh, uh, Jerusalem. And, and Isaiah preaches to Isaiah and, or Ahaz, and he says, hey, don't be afraid, right? Don't be afraid that this is happening, or Syria, not Assyria. Don't be afraid that this is coming, that this is going to happen. It will come to nothing. And Ahaz kind of gets tested, right? He gets tested and he fails because Ahaz trusted in Assyria, right? So Ahaz, I know the names get kind of confusing, but Ahaz was putting his trust. He had formed an alliance with Assyria, the very nation that is coming later on to attack and destroy his son, Hezekiah, in verse 36. Okay. And so then about 15 years or so pass, um, and, and, and Isaiah is just preaching and preaching and prophesying to these people through verses uh, 7 through 35. And I don't know if you guys remember, but one of the dominant themes that Isaiah preaches on in this section is the coming day of the Lord. And so if you go back and you count, I think this is right. I, think, I, never, know, I never trust my counting. If you count, I think I counted 27 times in 27 chapters that Isaiah mentions the day of the Lord. And then after this section, right, after, um, after the section of him preaching, the day of the Lord is coming, it's coming, it's coming, and then boom, Isaiah 36 hits, Sennacherib is coming in, which is what we're talking about, right? His, his general, the Rabshakeh, is coming in, and it's like the day of the Lord is here, and we get this another punctuation in Isaiah's prophecy, and then after this, we'll again see Isaiah launch into this long, monumental prophecy series of sermons where he's preaching to Israel. So really, the structure structure of Isaiah is, is 1 through 6, summary and calling, right? 7 through 35, his first set of, of preaching with, punctuated with a, a real-life historical uh, take of Ahaz. And then we jump in again to 36, which is a real life through 39, real-life historical thing. And then 40 through 66, his second set of prophecies. 
Okay, so hopefully you've got a bit of a mental map in your mind, okay? If you don't, that's okay. Um, but we're going to be opening up this historical, real account um, of, of, uh, that Isaiah has given us of Sennacherib, of Assyria, beginning to invade and, and trying to take over Jerusalem, okay? And, and I think that the structure is actually pretty important. Like, I think that uh, when uh, Isaiah punctuates this way, when he puts real-life events in, I think he's, um, he's saying something about all the prophecy he just prophesied leading up to this real-life event, right? So he's been speaking about this coming day of the Lord, coming day of the Lord, coming day of the Lord, and then, boom, it happens. And remember, all of this prophecy in the Old Testament, oftentimes, I should say, it's fulfilled in the immediate, right then, but it's also fulfilled later on. Right? It's, it's, it's both and. It's already not yet. It has happened in this Assyrian invasion, but it, it also will happen, right? So the coming day of the Lord, I think Isaiah is talking about, is talking about the Assyrian invasion, and we see it here, but we know, right? And we can tell from reading Isaiah that he's also talking about the coming of the Lord Jesus, that, that there is a day coming like the day of the Assyrians, right? Like this day of the Babylonians, like this coming day of the Lord of judgment and of purification, of separating the wheat from the chaff, right? A day of righteousness is coming. And so with that, um, a little bit of history. Uh, what, let's read Isaiah 36. Let's just read the whole thing together, and then we'll go back through kind of chunk by chunk and, and, and see what the Lord might be saying to us. So in verse 1, he says, In the fourteenth year... Of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Israel, king Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. And the king of Assyria sent the Rabshakeh from Lachish, uh, Lachish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem with a great army. And he stood by the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the washer's field. And there came out to him Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household of Shebna the secretary, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder. And the Rabshakeh said to them, Say to Hezekiah, Thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, On what do you rest this trust of yours? And that's our essential question for this morning. Do you think that mere words are strategy and power for war? In whom do you now trust that you have rebelled against me? Behold, you are trusting in Egypt, that broken reed of a staff which will pierce the hand of any man who leans on it. Such is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who trust in him. But if you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and altars Hezekiah has removed, saying to Judah and to Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar? Come now, make a wager with my master, the king of Assyria. I will give you 2,000 horses if you were able on your part to set a single captain among the least. Sorry, I lost my spot. Um, Come now, make a wager with my master, the king of Assyria. I will give you 2,000 horses if you were able on your part to set riders on them. How then can you repulse a single captain among the least of my master's servants when you trust in Egypt for chariots and for horsemen? Moreover, is it without the Lord that I have come against this land to destroy it? The Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. Then Eliakim, Shebna, and Joah said to the Rabshakeh, Please speak to your servants in Aramaic, for we understand it. Do not speak to us in the language of Judah, within the hearing of the people who are on the wall. But the Rabshakeh said, Has my servant sent me to speak these words to your master and to you, and not to the men sitting on the wall, who are doomed with you to eat their own dung and drink their own urine? Then the Rabshakeh stood and called out in a loud voice in the language of Judah, Hear the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus says the king, Do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you. Do not let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord by saying, The Lord will surely deliver us. This city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah. For thus says the king of Assyria, Make your peace with me and come out to me. Then each one of you will eat of his own vine, each one of you his own fig tree, and each one of you will drink the water of his own cistern until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of grain and wine, a land of bread and vineyards. Beware lest Hezekiah mislead you by saying, The Lord will deliver us. 
Has any of the gods of the nations delivered his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharvaim? Have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? Who among all the gods of these lands have delivered their lands out of my hand, that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand? But they were silent and answered him not a word. For the king's command was, Do not answer him. Then Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, and Shebna, the secretary, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder, came to Hezekiah with their clothes torn and told him the words of the Rabshakeh. These are the words that God is speaking to us, Finnish Faith Church, this morning. And so in verses 1 through 3, we get kind of a history of what is happening in, Assyria, or in, in uh, Israel and Assyria in this time. Okay, so it's the 14th year of King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah has been reigning for a while. And if you go to Second Chronicles and you study, you know what kind of a reign this is. It is a glorious and wonderful and beautiful reign. It's really, really awesome. Like if you go and read it, I think I put a reference up, but I, I might have put it in the wrong place in my PowerPoint slide. If you, if you go read it, that people worship and praise the Lord with joy that they didn't have since the time of Solomon, which was a long, long, long time ago. I, Hezekiah rebuilds the altar. People come in and, and they're worshiping God from Israel and Jerusalem, which is kind of unheard of after the split between the northern and southern kingdoms. And there just seems to be massive revival breaking out. Massive revival. And just for anybody that maybe has a little bit of prosperity gospel in their hearts or in their soul, a little bit of prosperity gospel that has been taught to them, I just want us to recognize that Hezekiah has done, it seems like up to this point, everything right in faith, in worship of God, in praising Him, and uniting the whole country. Uh, 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 and then what happens? Invasion from Assyria. Uh, uh, not just invasion, but this is like incredibly, incredibly painful. Like, Assyria was a major superpower at the time. They were the superpower probably of the world. Their kingdom stretched for thousands of miles. It was probably the greatest kingdom that had ever existed up to this point. And Assyria had taken over everyone except for Jerusalem. When he says that uh, the Rabshakeh sent someone from Lachish, that was the last fortified city that was there to protect Jerusalem from uh, uh, Assyria. And, And now it's gone, and it's just Jerusalem. It's just Jerusalem. If you remember the word picture that Isaiah gives us, he says, I will send this water, which is Assyria, and it will flood your banks all the way up to the head, right? Like above your knees, above your chest, above your, 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 your neck, right? All the way up to your head. You are about to drown. These guys are in, in deep, deep, deep trouble. It seems really bad. And Hezekiah is, is facing a test right? He's, he's facing a test. And, and, and I think it's really important for us to realize that, that I think what Isaiah is doing is he's juxtaposing Ahaz and Hezekiah. He's saying, this is what happened when Ahaz was tested this way. Let's look at what happens when Hezekiah is tested this way. And the reason I think that is because they were both tested at the exact same point. Go back with me to Isaiah 7 here. Let's just see, is this, is this right for me to compare Ahaz and Hezekiah this way? What evidence, what ground do I have for that? Well, if you look down at verse 3, three in Isaiah chapter seven, this is what it says. The Lord said to Isaiah, go out to meet Ahaz, you and Shir Jashub, your son. And where is he meeting? At the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the washer's field. Okay, so he's going out to meet Ahaz at this point. Now go with me back to 36 in verse, um, verse two, where is the king of Assyria meeting Hezekiah's representatives, and he stood by the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the washer's field. Do you see that? I, I, I don't think that's a coincidence. I, I don't think anything in the Bible is a coincidence. I, our God wrote this with intention and with purpose, right? And structure matters, and, and these illusions matter, and what he's saying matters. He's talking to him in the exact same place with an incredibly similar situation, right? And what happened to Ahaz? God said, hey, ask me for a sign. Ask me for anything you want, and I'll show you that this is not going to come to pass. And Ahaz says, far be it from me to not to ask you from a sign. Portraying holiness when we know the truth is he doesn't want a sign from God. He doesn't want to trust in God because he's trusting in the king of Assyria. He's already made a covenant with the king of Assyria. And how foolish to do that if God's already going to deliver you regardless of what you do. 
So he doesn't want to listen. He doesn't want to trust God. He doesn't want to believe in God. And so he, he doesn't, and he, and along with thousands and thousands of his men, are carried off into Israel, and it's just, it's horrible for them. And yet here we have Hezekiah, and we have Hezekiah being challenged by the Sennacherib, being challenged by, his, uh, uh, by um, Assyria. And, and it's kind of the same question we're asking here. Hezekiah, who will you trust? It's the same question God asked Ahaz. And it's the same question he asks us every day. In whom will you trust? And that's the, that's the essential question. That's the question I think that God is asking with this text. I think that's the question that we need to ask ourselves as a church this morning. In whom will we set this trust? Who will we trust? And, and just a quick word uh, about, uh, just a little bit of apologetics here, just a quick word about this beginning. All of these facts, this is just wonderful, and Isaiah 36, 1 through 3, all of these things can be attested to in, in archaeological diggings and finding and researching. Like, if you just go do a little bit of research on, on the king of Assyria, what you're going to find, can you pull up that picture? What you're going to find is um, that, that all of these things can be corroborated. They can all be corroborated, right? So this is an actual, um, like, relief, I think is what it's called, Becca, my artist, is that what it's called? A relief? It's like a, a carving almost, and it, and it portrays the Assyrian army taking over Lachish, this last place, this last fortified defense before they come into Jerusalem. And if you go and you study, you can find out all kinds of things about the Assyrians. They write about the siege in Jerusalem. They write that they were not able to take Jerusalem. They write that they had to leave because somebody from Cush was coming to attack and, and all these things are happening. All these things that the Bible attests to are fact. And this is important, not so that we can say to our unbelieving friends, ha, I'm smart and ha, you're dumb. That's not what apologetics is for. It's not so that we can say to our unbelieving friends, this is why you're an idiot and I'm intelligent. It's because our faith is a historical faith. It means our faith is based on events that happened, right? Like, like Jesus rose from the dead. If that didn't historically, factually happen, if that's just a myth, if that's just a story, if that's just an analogy, then let's just walk out of this place right now and go just eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Do you get what I'm saying? Like apologetics matters because our faith rests on the factual narrative, historical narrative that it happened. And guys, time and time and time again, the Bible is supported and withstood by archaeological evidence. And this should give you extreme confidence in your faith. Not extreme confidence that you can go win a debate. Extreme confidence that Jesus did rise from the dead. There is a God in heaven. He did make this whole world. It did flood. There was an Assyrian king. Solomon did exist. He had incredible kingdom, right? All of these things can be verified, and all of them ought to say, I trust you, Jesus. I trust you, Jesus. I trust you. I'm just banking on the fact that this thing is true. Banking on it. And so we turn, and in the next section of Isaiah 36, uh, is, is 4 through uh, 12. And I think the structure of this chapter from there goes the Rabshakeh giving a speech and then the Israelites responding. And then the Rabshakeh giving a speech and then the Israelites responding. That's kind of the pattern. So the first speech of the Rabshakeh is all about trust. It's all about trust. The Rabshakeh asks, in fact, I think he says six times the word trust comes up in this first speech. Six times he's asking, who will you trust? On what will you trust? Who do you trust? Do you trust Egypt? Do you trust this guy? Don't trust him. Trust me, right? And so um, they respond. And then the second speech is all about deliverance. Seven times in these few chapters, uh, the Rabshakeh says, uh, who will deliver you? Don't trust Hezekiah. I will deliver you. Don't trust this. No one will deliver you. It's deliverance, 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 deliverance. And so I think that's the way that this um, speech kind of gets broken down in the beginning. It's, it's who will you trust, and at the end, who will deliver you, which of course are very similar questions. Very similar questions. And so the Rabshakeh said to them, Say to Hezekiah, this is verse 4, Thus says the great king of, his, uh, of Assyria, <laughs> the great king, right? He's, he's making his king great, this great king, and he doesn't give Hezekiah the same honor. Thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, On what do you trust this trust, rest this trust of yours? And what do you rest this trust on yours? And, and I want to remember that always, guys, whenever we're reading the Bible, I think we should remember that these things were not written to us, right? Right, these things were written to the Jews at the time. These things were written to, right, like uh, the Rabshakeh said this to Hezekiah. He's literally asking him, who are you going to trust in this day? And so we should be careful to just quickly apply things to ourselves that we're reading the Old Testament, right? 
<laughs> we should be careful to do that. We should keep in mind the biblical historical context. And, and, and in this case, uh, Hezekiah has, if you go read again in Second Chronicles, he's built up his city, right? He's taken a stand even though everybody around him has fallen. He's, he's putting energy and effort into withstanding the Assyrians. And so the Rabshakeh is asking, why are you doing this? Why are you investing all these resources, all these energy, all these things into defending me? You will not stand. It's all for nothing. It's all for nothing. Uh, uh, but we, we know we have to think about how we can apply this for every word of God is for our upbuilding, right? That's what 2 Timothy 3.16 says. Every word of God is for our good, does train us in righteousness. And so how can we apply this? Well, I think Isaiah has been saying that this coming day is much like the coming day when Jesus comes back, right? It's much like it. And so I just, I mean, my mind goes to Hebrews 10. I think this is one of the verses that most clearly illustrates the coming day of the Lord and, and our response to it. And so Hebrews 10, starting in verse 37, says this, For yet a little while, and the coming one will come, that's Jesus, and will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith, which is a very similar thing to trust, is it not? My righteous one will live by faith, and if he shrinks back, if he, if he doesn't continue in the faith, if he doesn't trust me to save him, if he, if he gives up, if he gives in, right? I think shrinking back would be the equivalent of saying, okay, uh, Rabshakeh, okay, we give up, we're coming out. You could just be nice to us, be easy on us, right? I, I think that's the equivalent of shrinking back to us. My soul has no pleasure in him. But we, guys, Vintage Faith Church, I think us, it's fair to, we are not the kind of people, we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. I deeply believe that about you in this building, that when Jesus comes, if I'm with you, if we're getting coffee and Jesus comes back, me and you are just going to be like, it's happening, it's happening, Jesus is here, let's go to him, let's rejoice, while everyone us around us flees in terror, shrinks back. But we are not of those who shrink back because we have been looking forward to the coming of the Lord our whole lives. Our whole lives have been wondering, is this the day that Jesus comes back? Is this the day when he makes it all right? Is this the day where my faith becomes sight? Is this the day where we're all confirmed and all the sacrifice we made and all the pain we experienced and all the, all the frustration and doubt just is gone? Is this the day that happens? This is what I think it looks like for us to trust God, is on that day for us to draw near to him, is to welcome the coming of that, to, to long for the coming of that day. And yet, we know that trust is not just about the coming day of the Lord, right? We know trust is every single day of our lives. And so what does trusting in God look like? Um, uh, I, I've told some of you this. I haven't told some of you this. Um, and mom, if you're listening, I love you, but my mom has been diagnosed with cancer recently. Um, she was uh, taken to the hospital last night. She kind of passed out, but she's, she's doing okay. Uh, we're reaching out to her. And um, it's just been interesting listening to how people encourage me in this time. It's, it's interesting because there are some people that just say, man, let's, I'm just going to pray with you, and I just love you. I'm praying for your mom. I'm, we're really seeking her good. And then there are other people who just seem to, I mean, I, they almost have like this supernatural. They're like, oh, everything's going to be fine. Like, like just have this confidence. Everything is going to be fine. She's going to get well. Everything's going to be okay. You know, I just, just trust God. Just trust the Lord. And, and man, guys, I'll just be honest. I just, I struggle with that second one because we live in a world where people die, right? Like we live in a world that's broken and torn apart by sin. And I am wary of the kind of theology that says, if you just have enough faith, it will happen for you. I understand. I don't understand a lot of the New Testament. I understand sometimes it really seems like that's what Jesus is saying. And, and I'm open to debating with that. But I'm just, I'm just wary of it because guess what? Everyone has died. Like everyone. Nobody has had enough faith to keep living. If that's the case, everyone has died up to this point, right? Like, like everyone gets sick. Like Timothy got sick and he had to drink some wine. Like Paul had something wrong with his eye. Apparently Paul didn't have enough faith, right? Like I'm just, I'm wary of this theology. Is this what it really means for me to trust God? It means for me to just skip along through life and think nothing bad is ever going to happen to me. I, I don't think so. I, I, just, I just don't see it. I don't, I don't believe it from the Word of God. What I see in the Word of God is a lot of pain and a lot of tragedy and a lot of hardship and trusting God through all of that, Right? So what does that look like then? I, I think it looks like, 
I think, uh, and I get this largely out of the Sermon on the Mount, I think, I think trusting God looks like trusting and believing that all of his commands are good. Like, like he always wants what's good for you. Like trust, I think always, or not always, I think trust tends to, in, in this life and ours, tends to live in the realm of what you can control. Right? So what it looks like is, is maybe you've had a hard time paying your bills. Like a really hard, like, like you've just barely been making it and you get kind of frustrated with your wife when she goes and spends $300 at Target. I love you. My wife does not do that. That is not an allusion to my wife. She, Becca's awesome. She does it. <laughs> right? But, but then tax season rolls around. Right? And man, you've got this chance. You can make a little bit more if you just say your home office is this big and not that big. Right? Like, you could make like $500 more. Who are they to know? You already give taxes, right? And look at all these other people that are stealing and lying and cheating. What does it look like to trust in the Lord? It looks like to believe Him when He says to deal honestly, that it will go better for you, right? It looks like, as Hebrews says, to keep your life free from the love of money because He Himself has told you, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. And so trust in God looks like being honest in your taxes. Does that make sense? Trust in God looks like, uh, I don't know, when, when your enemy smacks you and when you're, when you're being disavowed by the community and everybody hates you and you just want to show that you're a, you're a good guy and you don't deserve this and you want to fight back. Trust in God looks like, no, it's better to just let them revile you. It's better. Blessed are you when they revile you and they say all these things for my name's sake, right? When it looks like and you think you should just store up treasures in this life, trust in God looks like saying, nope, Jesus says an eternal life is coming. It's not better to do that. It's better to give than to receive. Trust in God lives in our everyday life. It just lives here. And the lie that Satan has been telling us from the beginning is, did God really say it'll be better? Did God really say, I mean, you'll have more money if you lie. It'll be easier. Nobody will have to know. Don't trust God. God's way is not the right way. Trust me. Trust your flesh. Trust sin. Trust the way that God does not. But trusting God is to obey God. And so we rest our trust, we anchor this trust on believing that God is good and believing that God knows what he's saying and in believing that God knows what's best and wants what's best for us, right? Like if you're a young single couple and you're, and you're counseling them, maybe they're dating and they're just really, really wrestling with purity and they just don't understand how it could be better to wait, they're not trusting God. God says it's better to wait. It's more blessed to wait. And if they do not wait, it's a trust issue. They're not trusting God. And this is how we encourage one another. And I think this is what Hezekiah is posed with. Are you going to trust God or are you going to trust the Rabshakeh? This is the argument that the Rabshakeh gives in 13 through 21. He says, don't trust Hezekiah, right? Don't trust the Lord. He says, if you trust me, I'm going to let you eat of your own vine. I'm going to let you drink of your own water. I'm going to make life really great for you. And if we go back and do a little bit more research again of the Assyrians, what we're going to find is that is a giant lie. The Assyrians loved to torture people. Loved it. They would flay the skin off of people's backs and then post it onto the walls of their castles. They would invent torture machines for people that did give in and surrender to this massive army that they felt like they had no chance against. And here's Sennacherib saying, if you just trust me, if you just believe in me, everything's going to go well. And this is the same lie, friends, that sin tells us every single day. Day. I just want to pound this drum with us. If you just get bitter and angry with your husband or your spouse, they'll eventually change. Right? If, if you just lie on your taxes, if you just cheat at work, if you just do this, if you just do that. But trusting in God is to do the godly thing and to say, I don't believe you. I don't believe you. I don't believe you. I believe God. I trust God. I rest in God. I think this is what Hezekiah was posed with. I think this is what we're posed with daily. And this is what we will be posed with when Jesus returns. Who will we trust? 
Now listen, none of us do this perfectly. <laughs> I don't do this perfectly. You don't do this perfectly. But this is also salvation. And so if you're a non-believer listening this morning by chance, or if you're a non-believer in the room listening this morning, this is beautiful. This historical aspect of the gospel that we've saying that Jesus really did die for the sins of the world, that he really did rise again from the dead, and that you can just trust him. And that trust him that he paid for your sin, he trust him that he washed you clean of everything. This is salvation. And I think sometimes, this is one of my last points, I think sometimes we can put a big emphasis on the experience, right? Like you'll hear me or you hear Chad share our, our testimony and it's just this crazy, I was crazy, I was drinking, I was partying, I was doing all these things and then Jesus came and it was like I swallowed sunshine and, I was, and we're like, oh man, I don't know if I have that big of an experience. Maybe my salvation experience isn't legit. Right? Like, like it's a, a question I know homeschoolers especially can write. I've just, I've just kind of believed this thing as long as I can remember. Am I, am I legit? Is this thing mine? Have I owned my faith? And, and I think the word of the Bible, what we see over and over and over again is the New Testament prophets point back to a historical event. The one who we have seen, who we have listened to, who we have touched with our hands, him we proclaim, right? Uh, this, this happened. Jesus rose from the dead. Believe and be saved. Jesus' death on the cross was incredibly dramatic so that you believing and being saved does not have to be dramatic. It can just be a small turning from your sin to trust in Christ. You can happen this morning and nobody would know it <laughs> until you started to live differently. It's not about the experience. It's about trusting in something that happened. And friends, as believers, a true and deep and abiding trust in that will yield peace for us. He is our greatest treasure and he will never leave us nor forsake us. Our homes can get burned down. Our friendships can depart. Our, our, our marriages can break down. Our children might not believe, but Jesus will not depart from us. Deeply believing that and having Christ as your treasure will result in deep peace. It really will. Like we will be a people of peace. No anxiety. Right? I mean, I understand that there's some physical, uh, mental things that happen with a lot of people, but, but this, as far as spiritual depression and spiritual anxiety, it can flee from trusting in God. It can flee. And so like Hezekiah was, and like we want to be, we want to be people that trust God, that when the enemy comes and says, trust me, we want to say, no, I'm believing in the Lord. And, and let's not forget, Isaiah had 15 years of preaching, right? Hezekiah was not just banking this on uh, unfounded faith, but Hezekiah had been telling him for 15 years, this day is coming, this is going to happen, this is coming, and quietness and trust is your strength. I will destroy the rod of my anger. You will be saved in the day of the Lord, right? right? He had something to bank on, and it was the word of God. We have something to bank on this morning. It's the word of God that to walk in trust with him in this life and the next will yield salvation. Um, so that's what we want to live like. That's what we want to bank on as a church. Let me pray and we'll go. Lord, I just praise you for these truths of your word that you are trustworthy. God, Satan from the beginning has been trying to undermine our trust in you. And God, I just don't want to listen anymore. God, if there's anything in the people's hearts that you have been trying to get them to trust in you and they just have not been able to give themselves over, would you just free them from the bonds and the lies of Satan? And I pray that they would just trust in you, Jesus. That they would just look to you and say, you will save me on the day. I trust that. I do trust you, Jesus. And maybe for some people, that means salvation this morning. Maybe for, the, for some people, for the first time, they really trust you, Jesus, that you love them, that you died for them, that you will save them in that day, God. Oh, God, be merciful to them, I pray. I pray that you grant them repentance. I pray for us uh, Christians, if there's any sin that we're walking in, that we're just not trusting you. God, if there's any lies that we're walking in, we're just not trusting you. Any lusts that we're walking in, we're just not trusting you. God, I pray that we would believe that you have our best in mind, that you are for us and not against us, that you will never depart from us, God. And I pray that we would just turn from our sin and trust a loving Father and walk in peace and freedom. Lord, it's for freedom that you've set us free. We pray these things in your name, Lord. Amen.